Good morning. My name is Rick Kagey. I serve on the Board of Elders here for the St. John's Renewal Ministries. I'm glad to be here with you today as we begin a, a new sermon series around the book of Titus. And uh, Titus is a book that contains um, sort of a, the building blocks of, of what we might call Christian character, those foundational things that demonstrate a life in Christ. And so as we go through that, you know, we all like to think that we have pretty good character, but uh, Pastor A.J. sent me a little thing yesterday about some everyday things that happen that might reveal our character. Um, for instance, how do you react when someone steals your parking spot at the grocery store? You know, you're driving down the lane, you see it, it's right there, and all of a sudden somebody comes the other way and sneaks in there. You know that? Does that, like, ruin your day? <laughs> or does that, you know, are you like, okay, that's cool. It wasn't my spot. Well, I'll move on. Um, here's a good one. What happens when the Internet doesn't load fast enough? How do you, how do you re react to that? You know, is that, is that a problem for you? Do you really, does, that, does that really set you off? Um, how about the shopping carts? What do you do with your shopping cart when you're done? Do you leave it by your car? Do you put it where it belongs? I heard a guy actually, he preached almost a whole sermon around this. And this guy actually has a ministry, not really a ministry, but part of what he does was, is he, um, he's, he goes around the parking lots and he'll collect the parking lot, the buggies for the guys. And he calls it buggy love. And uh, his whole thing was about, you know, I do this and then people come up to me and they'll go, why are you doing this? And, he, and then he can sort of say, well, you know, I just do this as a way of showing my love for you and and this guy went on for 20 minutes about his buggy love thing. And I thought, I think that's kind of cool, you know. So it, it clicked with me that, yeah, even I just put my shopping cart back, that's helping somebody out. So that's one, one other way. Here's another good one. You know, how do you respond to, to compliments? You know, how do you, uh, how do you um, what do you say when somebody says, you know, hey, nice job? And this one actually particularly hit home because this is what this guy reads. He says, uh, Christians are famous for false humility. Thanks, that wasn't me, that was the Lord. Sounds good, but there are several problems with it. First, the Lord probably doesn't sing or preach as poorly as you do. Ouch and amen, right? Um, so, so these are, you know, in our everyday life, we want to demonstrate a Christian character. We want to show to the world how Christ has worked in our lives to, um, to help us share his love in a way that's meaningful and tangible. And that's what the book of Titus will lead us to. And before we get into the scripture, I wanted to spend a little time kind of developing who's Titus? Who's this guy Titus? And why is there a book in the Bible named after him? And he's kind of an interesting guy. He, um, he doesn't appear in the book of Acts. His name isn't mentioned, but he was there. And we know that from the, from the epistles. And we're going to look at a few of those right in a minute. But, but what you kind of find as you dig into this guy Titus is he seemed to be a bit of a turnaround artist. He was a guy that, that the Apostle Paul could send in to, to troubled churches or difficult situations and, and be very persuasive and have some effectiveness. And the first time that Paul shows up, or Titus shows up, is in the book of Galatians. And uh, it says, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I pro proclaimed among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Now let me kind of fill you in on what's going on here. Uh, Paul here is talking about a uh, situation occurred, most likely in Acts 15 is the description, is what happened. Uh, there was some controversy in the church around whether saved Gentiles needed to be circumcised as sort of a demonstration of their um, acceptance of Christ. And Paul was preaching to the Gentiles who were not Jewish people, so they were not circumcised. And 
And this revelation he talked to is that basically God had revealed to him that they don't need to do that. That's not necessary. It's, it's extra, and that's not what I'm about. And so Paul and Barnabas go down to Jerusalem to meet with the sort of the heads of the church in Jerusalem, the original Christians, if you will, that were based in Jerusalem. And, and they had this pretty good discussion around this, and they eventually came to the conclusion that no, Gentiles don't need to be circumcised. But it's interesting that he took Titus. So, you know, if you're taking a guy and you need a, a sort of a test case, you're going to show these guys, look, man, this guy gets it, right? He, he knows what's going on. You don't need to add anything to this. He's a, he's a saved Christian because he's heard, he's heard the gospel and he believes it. They, he needed a solid dude that could, could really help him make the case that this is unnecessary. And Titus was that guy. And so I think that says something about Titus being, having the ability to, to, to share the gospel, to ex- explain his faith, and to, to, um, to persuade people um, of, of where he's coming from. And there's also part of me that thinks Titus might have been a physically imposing guy. Like, you know, you want to tell Titus he's got to be circumcised? Not me. I'm not going to do that. But I don't know. I'm just making that up. We'll see. The next time we see Titus is in the book of 2 Corinthians. Now, the Corinthian church was a real problem church for Paul. And if you're uh, familiar with the history here, Paul actually, there's two books in the Bible that are letters from Paul to the Corinthians that are trying to correct the church's behavior and, and get some people back on track. Um, but actually, there may have been as many as four letters that went to the, to the Corinthians. And one of these letters, Paul sent with Titus. And just to tell you the problem he had here, so there's a problem in the church. He's already written two letters. He sends Timothy to go try to straighten him out. Timothy doesn't have any luck. He goes himself, Paul himself, goes to Corinthians. Corinth and, and tries to get these guys on track and, and they basically run him out of town he goes back to Ephesus and he writes another letter and he sends Titus and then he says I'm going to go meet Titus and he, so he starts heading for, for Corinth and along the way somewhere along in Macedonia he runs into Titus Titus is coming back and this is what he writes he said God who comforts the downcast comfort us by the coming of Titus and not only by his coming but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you. As he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced still more. Therefore we are comforted, and besides our own comfort, we rejoice still more at the joy of Titus, because his spirit had been refreshed by you all. So Titus comes back and gives him a good report. He says, they they got it, guy. You know, Paul, they finally figured it out. You know, this last letter worked. I talk to them, and they're back on track. And so that, you know, really speaks to, again, Titus was a man who could go into a difficult situation and turn things around. And then the last thing, the last time that Titus is mentioned, just sort of to complete the story, other than what we're going to look at here in a minute, is in the, the 2 Timothy 4, 9. These are some of the last words that Paul wrote that are recorded for us, that, that are in the Bible. He's writing to Timothy. He's, he's at the end of his second Roman imprisonment. He's about to be uh, executed. He says, do your best to come to me for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring with him, for he is very useful to me for ministry. So at the end of Paul's ministry, Titus, Paul gives Titus one more responsibility, sends him to Dalmatia, get him a dog with spots on it or something. I don't know. Um, no. <laughs> probably, probably trouble in Dalmatia, right? Who knows? Or I guess maybe he was giving him an easy job for a change. But, but the point is, is this is you know, the, the last mention of Titus as he goes off to do more ministry on behalf of Paul and the church. I'll hit on Demas real quick. It's sort of a cautionary tale. I, I like this this verse, because Demas is actually mentioned in the book of Acts as 
traveling with Paul on his missionary work. And he was a, he was a solid dude. But love of this present world, he left. I'll leave that there. Again, just a side note, not to get too far off. So with that said, that's Titus. That's, that's who we're dealing with. And, and so we go in now to, the, to this letter that Paul writes. Uh, it would appear that Paul and Titus and probably some others, after T- Paul's first Roman imprisonment, went from Rome back into Asia Minor. And along the way, they stopped in, in Crete, and they founded some churches. And um, Paul leaves Titus behind. And he starts the letter with this. He says, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in his word, through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. This is a long sentence, and I want to kind of unpack it for you, and I want to spend some time here. Um, This is just Paul's introduction. Why am I writing this letter? What is it that I'm trying to accomplish? What what are we doing here? And I want to start from, work my way back from the end, sort of the, the back to the front. Starts with eternal life, which God promised before the ages began. Eternal life with God is the default setting. When God created the world, that was his hope. That was his reason for creation, was to to live in community, in oneness, in harmony with us humans. So at the beginning of time, when he created Adam and Eve, his his hope was that we would live eternally with him in the Garden of Eden on this beautiful planet. And that plan went south, right? Adam and Eve sinned, and so he came up with a new plan. And he gave us his son Jesus to forgive us of his sins. And if you take nothing away from today from what I say, I want you to know that God wants to have eternal life with you. And he's promised it. And it starts, it starts with faith, but we'll get there. But we have the hope of eternal life because of Jesus. Because Jesus died on the cross, took our sins on our behalf. We can stand before the Father forgiven, and we can enter into that eternal life. And you you might think that happens when we die, But we actually enter into that eternal life here on earth. And that's the godliness part. Because we have eternal life, because God has given us that gift of salvation. We should desire to live in a way that reflects who he is and what he's done in our life. And and so we, we should strive towards godliness. And we don't do it because we want to get to heaven. We do it because we've been given the gift of heaven. And so we strive to reflect that in what we do. And our character should show that. And we do that through faith and knowledge. But it starts with faith. My friend uh, Nathan Carlson is here. He wrote a book called Fearing God. You're going to talk about that in a little bit with me. But in that book, he develops this concept, this idea that our understanding of God begins with faith. Our understanding of the fear of the Lord begins with believing. And that's the beauty of of infant baptism. A little baby who cannot understand anything about God can be placed into the faith of of his father and his mother through baptism and once you've accepted as a little child that God is who he says he is that his word is true that his son died for you on the cross and forgave your sins you can begin to build your understanding 
of what it means to walk with him. And so that's the purpose of what Paul wants Titus to do in Crete. He wants the people of Crete to have faith and understanding towards godliness because they've been given eternal life. That's the whole point of this letter. The rest of it is sort of the how-to. How do we get there? And we'll go on. So, to Titus, my true child, true is a genuine, real, solid guy in common faith. Grace and peace is a common Pauling greeting. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. This is why I left you in Crete, so you might put what remained into order. Now, a note about Crete. I, I told you that uh, you know, Titus was a bit of a turnaround artist. Let me tell you what he was walking into here. I'm going to skip ahead a few verses because I don't think we're going to see this part. But this is the situation in Crete. This is verse 10, which we're not going to get to today, and I don't think it picks up later, so I wanted to share this. <laughs> there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party, those are the Jewish people. They must be silenced that they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars and beasts, lazy gut gluttons. This testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and commands of people who turn away from the truth. So not a pretty picture of the Cretans. And that's what Paul has left Titus there, is to, to correct that. Um, but I would contend that it's not a pretty picture for us all the time either, right? I mean, uh, we're all a little Cretan, right, sometimes. So this is where he goes from there. It says, we're going to appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If everyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and op not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. I want to break here for just a second and, and talk about elder, elders and elder leadership. This church is, is, uh, is an elder-led congregation. And it's modeled off of these New Testament letters from Paul where he sent guys around like Titus to appoint elders. Appoint men of the community who were of solid faith to lead the church. And, you know, Pastor AJ's leaving. Your pastor's leaving. That's hard. But the leadership of this church hasn't changed. There's still the same group of elders who, who brought AJ to, to build this foundation and to bring this place to fruition. We're still here and we're still leading and looking for that next person, for the next way to go. So there's, there's, um, there's sadness, but there's hope. And there's joy in knowing that God has a plan. And, and your pastors are supposed to move around. You know, they're like head coaches on a football team, you know. Sometimes you need to hear a new voice. And, you know, Paul moved around. Titus moved around. These guys, you know, they, they didn't see their job as staying to lead a particular church. They said, we're going to put guys in charge that are community, you know, that aren't going anywhere to help lead it. And so that's, that's what the model is from the early church, and that's what we follow here. So I just want you to rest easy knowing that, that those of us on the Board of Elders are, um, are, are committed and we're going to see this through and, and we're looking forward to the next, next phase of this ministry. And now I get to the hard part because now I've got to tell you what I'm supposed to look like. <laughs> Those of us who, who serve in that role, and I'll be honest with you, we're not there, okay? This is, this is a constant battle that we're, we're striving towards these things but we're all sinners, and we're all, um, we all fall short. But the important thing is anyone who's above reproach, this is the idea of, of 
Sometimes it's translated blameless, which I think this is better. Because the idea is that, you know, you can't be called out on anything. You can't be, um, you sort of need to be inimpunable or, or, or there can't be anything against you that somebody might say you're, 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 not, um, you're not qualified. Um, husband of one wife, some of these are kind of easy. <laughs> uh, insubordinate, not open to the charge of it. So again, not open to the charge, insubordinate, and a, um, God's steward. You know, we're here to steward God's ministry. And that's uh, how we view it, how we, how, we, how we see it as we go. Here's the rest of it. Must not be arrogant or quick-tempered. And, and what I think it's important to walk away from this He's just describing somebody who should be a mature Christian. And so these things, while he's talking about, you know, I want you to appoint elders who look like this, ultimately we should all look like this. And that's where the rest of the letter goes. It's basically the rest of the letter says, and then Titus, what you need to do is get everybody up to this sort of, you know, but find some guys like this that can kind of be an example. And again, we don't nail them all the time, but... We, we hopefully are, you know, somewhere in God's grace that, that we can demonstrate Christian character. So, must not be arrogant, quick-tempered, drunken, or violent, or greedy for gain. These are the knots. Don't want any of those. I get pretty good on two or three of them. Um, but hospitable, lover of good. So, these are the, what you're looking for. Hospitable, lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. And again, this is, this is, all this is, is is a picture of a mature Christian. A Christian, a a person, a high character Christian that's understood the foundational teachings of God, and this is what we're striving for. And as leaders, we hope to model that. But most important, what you want from a leader is someone who holds firm in the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Our goal more than anything is to make sure that this church stands firm in the word of God and the, and the, the faith that he's given us. And when we are up here giving instruction we do everything in our power to make sure that everything we tell you is true. There is, you know, if I'm um, communicating something that is not straight out of the Bible, you know, like some of that stuff I talked to about Titus that requires some more intuition, I always make sure what I'm seeing is two or three good solid sources that are pointing me in that direction. I don't want anything that I say up here to, 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 to be wrong. Now, that's not saying I'm going to get that 100%, but that's my goal, is I want to give sound instruction. And it's interesting, there's a a time, whenever I come up here to do one of these messages, right at the beginning, where my mind just goes blank. It's almost like I I have no idea what I'm going to say. And... uh, and I, at that point, I just put myself in the care of the Holy Spirit, you know, and I, I try to roll into it, and, and hopefully it comes out well. And that's, that's our job, as, you know, for up here doing this, but it's also your job as parents. Our job as fellow believers with one another, you know, helping younger believers understand more based on our experience and based on our, our understanding. And finally, to rebuke those who contradict it. You know, in other words, if someone is preaching a gospel other than Christ, we need to be able to say, that's wrong. That's not who we are. So that's the first nine verses of Titus. That's where we're going to leave it for today. Um, and we're going to continue through this book. I think next week will be a little bit of a break because AJ is going to give his, his farewell but, uh, but beyond that, we're going to go pretty much through this book verse by verse, and we're, and we're going to see 
how Paul is, is instructing Titus to help all of us raise our level of Christian character. So I look forward to joining you for that the rest of the way. It won't be me doing all of them, but I um, hope, hope we can continue with us as we go through that. Amen?